How's it? My name is Tom from Emmanuel Church, and we're really glad that you could join us for this video. This is a recording of our Sunday service, and it is a resource that is there to be an encouragement for you, as well as a reminder of God's Word. Please do not see this by any means as a way to replace going to your local church or getting involved there. And if you're in a scenario where you're not linked to a local church, please either get in contact with us or go look around and get stuck in with your local church there. Finally, if you want to know a little bit more about the gospel or how you can support the ministry here at Emmanuel Church, you can go check out the link below. Thanks. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 49. That is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come? You fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you are not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat or another grain. But God gives it a body as he wants, and to each of the seeds its own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. There is one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is, a different, is different from that of the earthly ones. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another star in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. So in a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the natural is not the first, sorry, however, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. Like the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Maria. Got him. Thanks. Right. Okay. Now, uh, just before we... <clears throat> press into this passage Maria's just read for us. Um, in the life, earlier this week, uh, uh, development in the life uh, of Emmanuel Church is Alf Connack, um, a member of our Emmanuel family, uh, earlier on in the week, in fact, went to uh, be uh, with his Lord and Savior. Now, many of you might not know uh, Alf and his wife, Betty, or many of you who might um, have joined the church over the last couple of years might not recognize them. Uh, they're a couple who live at Aldersgate Retirement Village and have, uh, they haven't been driving uh, for a number of years, uh, but they've remained committed members uh, here uh, at Emmanuel, always following along through our online services, keeping in touch with various members, and in fact, always keeping abreast through our AGMs and you know, every now and then checking in with me, finding out you know, what's going on and how they can be praying for the church, uh, very much aware uh, of what's going on here. And yesterday at a memorial service at Aldersgate, uh, we remembered Elf. Um, and I think it's quite fitting, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you've picked up on this, but each week uh, at Emmanuel, at our services, what we do is we, we have a theme for the service. And for the most part, those themes are based on the convictions we hold to as a church. Uh, and in fact, today's theme, or today's conviction, is that we teach God's Word. Uh, and Elf specifically uh, loved uh, the Word. Uh, and what a testimony his life was to that. Um, Alf and Betty, uh, just shortly before Alf passed, celebrated their 60th, 66th uh, marriage anniversary. 66 years. Alf survived, is survived by Betty, four children, a number of grandchildren. Uh, he wasn't a man of many words, um, but that tremendous love that he had for God's word was seen uh, in him. Ultimately, his love uh, for the living word. Friends, as we carry on in 1 Corinthians 15 today, where Paul teaches us about the physical resurrected body, you can be sure 
after suffering from three strokes, after many years bound uh, by the effects of age and time, you can be sure Elf is enjoying uh, that new body today uh, with his Savior. So let's pray. I want to ask you to pray with me, not just uh, as we come to God's Word, uh, but for Betty and the rest of the family uh, and for the hope uh, that we have uh, and that we can hold on to uh, as we look at what the physical resurrection means for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, just testimonies of faithfulness, Lord, of uh, the fact that it's always you who live and work uh, in us and, and through your people and in your church. Lord, we thank you for what the testimony of 66 years of faithful marriage, of commitment and care and, uh, and love, Lord, just what a, a great witness that is uh, to your commitment to us, to the gospel. And so, Father, we do pray and ask that you continue to hold Betty and the rest of the Connack family in the palms of your hands. Be gentle with them, care for them. Lord, and continue to use us, continue to use Betty's neighbors uh, around. May she see uh, the love of Christ in many different ways, and may she know that, but ultimately, may it always be directly bound to who you are. And Lord, as we pray in that hope, and as we trust in that truth of uh, the resurrection, Lord, this morning too, we pray and ask uh, that you not only build our understanding, Lord, do that, we ask and pray, but Father, that through that, it always bring us to a response of praise to you that it always be something of growing our faithfulness as we see you, the ultimate faithful one. And Father, that it grow our hope in you and lessen the hold that we have on the things of this world. Do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, this morning, we're carrying on where we left off two weeks ago, 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Uh, by the way, we, we're kind of uh, approaching the runway as we're about to finish uh, in this letter. We're going to spend, uh, just after this, a few weeks looking at our plan and vision as I've been hopefully just kind of, you know, getting the interest, your, your interest going. Um, and we're going to have a short series, apologetic evangelistic series, um, in between uh, us finishing 1 Corinthians and starting our series in Revelation. So that's coming up, and please do pray uh, for that. Um, but last week, or not last week, two weeks ago, we left off halfway through 1 Corinthians 15, where if you uh, weren't here, you might, uh, might be worth knowing that some members uh, in the church were saying that Jesus didn't really physically rise from the dead. Uh, and that was based on what they believed, that it was uh, most likely they thought, well, it could be a spiritual kind of resurrection, but it wasn't physical. And if you weren't here, uh, I explained that the reason for this kind of thinking, it didn't just kind of pop out uh, out of a vacuum, but it came from the general view of, of the Corinthian society as a whole. Uh, that was largely influenced by Greek philosophers, guys like Plato uh, and Plutarch, who uh, for a number of years taught that the physical body was bad, that it was kind of second rate, that it had no real significance in relation to the spirit or to, to one's soul. And so just in general, not, not just something that came up within the church, but the general view of society, whether they were, were Christians or, or, or not, and mostly not, folk back then all around just believed that when one died, well, heaven was just kind of a, a spiritual place, a spiritual place. So the first part of the chapter, as we looked at, Paul not only confirms, not only proves that Jesus did physically rise from the dead, but he also shows the many implications of this, why it was the case, why it had to happen, and quite, le quite clearly what you see that through that first part of 1 Corinthians 15 is uh, we saw that, that the Christian faith, uh, that in fact all of it, all that we hold to is directly linked to Jesus' resurrection to his physical bodily resurrection. Now in today's passage, as Paul kind of moves along, as he carries on uh, addressing this issue, uh, what he shows us is that because Jesus walked out of the grave, quite simply, we too will also experience a physical bodily resurrection. Now, having said what he did about Jesus' resurrection, uh, what Paul does is he kind of preempts uh, what make, would make sense as a logical question uh, from the Corinthians that would follow on from that. Have a look at verse 35. He says, but someone will ask, how then, 
Or how are the dead raised, and what kind of body will they have when they come? Now, Paul anticipates this question. What kind of body will we have when we are raised? Now, like that kind of uh, anticipation or expected question, uh, I know there are also a countless kind of, of other sub-questions relating to this. You know, many, uh, many in fact, that, that I can recall wondering myself, uh, or, or many questions that I've heard over the years. You know, uh, if we die, uh, and maybe if we die kind of later in life or, or older on in years, uh, at what age does our resurrected body come back as? Have you ever wondered that? Ever thought about that? I, I kind of secretly hope 26. <laughs> that was a good, good time of, of life. But we don't know. We don't know. Or, or maybe this might have, might have baffled you. What happens if when you die, your body is cremated and the, and the ashes are spread? Or if you, you're killed in a nuclear meltdown and your body is just vaporized into hundreds of thousands of uh, of tiny fragments. How does God bring that all back again? And then there's many questions. Many of them maybe even valid uh, and, and interesting, but you can go on and on and on. You know, reconstructive surgery, where does that leave me? I joke with a few of my family members, my dad included, you know, who have a few artificial hips and knees and, and, and so forth, that you're, you know, you're, you're actually getting your heavenly body one piece at a time. The thing is, in, in today's passage, Paul doesn't answer every single one of those questions. He doesn't answer every single question. But what he does do is he does give us a number of, of very clear and basic parameters of how we can think about it all. In fact, he gives us what we need. He gives us what we need. And so, he gets going, verse 36, he, he starts by using the analogy of a seed. Have a look. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you are not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat or another grain. But God gives it a body as he wants, and to each of the seeds, its own body. To each of the seeds, its own body. And so just to start this morning, we start by realizing that our present physical bodies that God gives us are only, to use Paul's illustration, only a seed. Something of what later will become much greater. I remember